Today's shir will begin five lines from the top of Daf Yud Ches. Before we begin the actual Gemara, we glance at the side where we have a structural note. You see a Mivne heading, followed by a triangle. If you actually skim ahead in the Gemara, you'll notice where these triangles are positioned. They represent Sidra Shel She'elois, a series of questions, Benogea, Lixivas, Umechikas, Parsha Soito, Questions regarding the writing and the erasure of the portion that we refer to as uh, Parshas Sota, the section of the Torah that one is to write and eventually get erased in the Sota uh, process, in the Beis HaMikdash. And we'll see also questions regarding Lashkoya Sota, the drinking that she must do, the drinking of the special Sota water. The Gemara. Uh, note, by the way, we have a long question marking. The uh, nature of this long question is actually made up of a series of uh, sub questions, and each stage will, each uh, subsequent stage will uh, be introduced with a Ve'im Lomar, meaning if you assume uh, something from the earlier stage, we'll continue then to the next stage of questions. So now the Gemara text boy Rova Kosav Shne Megilos Lishte Sotos. He uh, wrote the uh, two Megilos, two uh, portions of writing, two separate um, parchments with for two Sotos, two women that appeared in the base of Megdosh. Umochakon Lusoich Kois Echod, and then they were erased over one cup. The cup, of course, is the cup containing the water that the sota is going to have to drink. In this case, we have two sotas. Mahu. What is the halachic status of what we just described? Writing two separate parshios for two separate women and then having it erased into one cup. Ksiva lishmo bo'inon vehoika. Is it so that we require that the writing of the Sota Parsha be done with specific intent for the specific woman. And that was done. Or do we also require... Now here, we're going to have a problem. We have to, we'll translate the Gemara, but the actual meaning of the Gemara is not in the translation. It's what we'll see in the Rashi. So, or is it that we require, in addition to the writing, which was clearly... Uh, each separate parsh, each parsha was written for each woman quite separately. Or is it that we require the erasure done done for each woman uh, specifically? Here, now, it, as we presented the Gemara, so each each parsha was erased separately. However, they were erased into one cup, so that when it came to, let's say, the ability to recognize uh, the erasure in a specific form, this one for this lady and this one for that lady, you wouldn't be able to recognize it anymore because they've been erased into one cup. So now, this explanation we uh, try to take from Rashi, and uh, we look at the Rashi uh, that you'll see uh, four lines from the top, Mechika, Nami, uh, do, do we require Mechika also, Bekois, into the cup, Lishma, Liat small means for a woman for the woman specifically, and here's the key point: she a nicker hamachiko she lishma that it should be recognizable that this particular erasure was done for her. But when it's in when two women's partios are erased into one cup, you don't have that element of specificity anymore. The im timselomar. And here we go on, we're leading up to now the second stage of questioning. And let us say then that we, we take the, the Bayes approach from the, uh, just the, the stage just before, namely that, we, that it's not enough that you, that you simply wrote the Parshios, uh, each one separately for a specific woman, but you also have to have the resultant erasure being uh, identifiable or clearly specific. Let's say they were uh, erased, in fact, into two separate cups. 
this is okay. This is better. This is an improvement than the the case just before, because in the case just before they were erased, but into one cup. Here they were erased into two separate cups. The chazar ve'irvan mahu. But then after they were erased into two separate cups, the they were then mixed together. Mechika lishma bo'inon vo'ika. Do we require simply that after the initial erasure? You have to have a an ability to recognize each one separately, and that you can do. That you would accomplish. You would have accomplished. Odilma ha lav dido koshasio vaha lav dido koshasio. Or maybe we are to emphasize the fact that now they uh, have been mixed together, and when each woman drinks, she's not necessarily drinking that which is. For her, it's mixed together with that which was for the other woman, and that therefore this would not be acceptable. The imtim selomar ha lav dido koshasya, the ha lav dido koshasya, and then let us assume taking the making the assumption that the fact that they were then they were mixed together uh, is in fact detrimental. What would the law be if after they were mixed together, they were then split into two separate cups? Do we say yesh breira o ein breira? Yesh breira is retroactive clarification or determination. In other words, that after they were uh, mixed together and then poured, that cup was then split into two separate cups. Do we say that cup number one contains that which was originally the Parsha for lady number one, and cup number two now contains retroactively that which was originally prepared for lady number two? That would be Brera. Or, we, or do we not hold from that? Or ain't braver? We don't say that. Look, f- uh, after all, they were mixed together, and when they were split, uh, they were split back into two separate cups. You can't, you can't say that this is that the, what's in cup number one is that which was for lady number one. It was it's the product of have, after having been mixed. This concept of braver of retroactive clarification is an, is a concept that appears throughout the Shas in many different cases. And here is just one more application of that. As far as what's the answer to all of these questions, teku, it remains unresolved. And you notice we have a double underline just to point out that uh, each one of these questions is going to end up the same way. Boy Rava, Hishka Besiv Mahu, Bishweferis Mahu. Let's say that the woman uh, drank the Sota water. She drank the the Sota water, besiv mahu. Uh, the a, a sieve is a straw, and likewise a shvoferis. Rashi says hishka besiv shehu chalul kederach shatinoikas shaisim. Chalul means something that's hollow. Uh, in other Gemaras, you find uh, that a sieve is a type of web work that is. Uh, uh, part of the growth of a palm tree. Uh, there's a note on the side uh, where the stars Pirush Nosan Hasiv Bamayim, Ubola Hasiv Lamayim, Kemin Svog, Venosan Hasiv Befiha Umotsetsis Lamayim. That's the Oruch's Pshat, where the, the sieve is an absorbent material that was placed in the water uh, and it absorbed the Sota water. Uh, similar to the way a sponge absorbs, and then the sota uh, sucked the absorbed water out of the sieve, out of the sponge-like material, we'll say, or uh, uh, having this sponge uh, characteristic, and she sucked the water. Is that considered a legitimate way of drinking? And shvoferis, that would be the common straw, a a tube. Shvoferis is a tube, is drinking from the through a straw, considered. Uh, acceptable. Derech shtiya b'kach or ain't derech shtiya b'kach? Are these considered uh, within the realm of normal shtiya? And why is it important for us to establish that? Because the Pesach says v'hishka, v'hishka she's given to drink. And the assumption is that uh, when the Torah 
uh, command something or issue something, its intention is to be done in the normal way. Uh, for, uh, now, if we just get off the topic momentarily, uh, when you look in the realm, for example, of Hilchas Shabbos. Hilchas Shabbos, there are 39 cardinal activities that one is to avoid doing on Shabbos. If one does any of those activities, take, let's say, the prohibition of writing on Shabbos. Taking a pen and paper and writing uh, letters uh, on Shabbos. Writing out a word on Shabbos. That is a Shabbos prohibition. Let us say you held a, a, a pen between your teeth and wrote in that fashion. That's not the normal way of writing. If one did that, he is not in violation of the Torah level prohibition of Shabbos violation. Of course, we don't permit it, but he wouldn't be guilty of a Torah level sin. The Torah, when it instructs you in how to do things, the expectation is that you're doing it in the normal way something is done. The concept of shinui, which means change, has uh, very broad applications as well. Here too, we see this being an issue. If the drinking through a straw is considered uh, not the normal way, so then she will, she will not have fulfilled her uh, requirements. Let's continue in the Gemara. Boy Ravashi. Nishpechu mehem v'nishtairu mehen mahu. Let us say some of the, the uh, soto water was prepared and, uh, it's, and, mo- and it's spilled out, but some remained. Is uh, the drinking of that which remains considered uh, sufficient or not? Teku. This remains unresolved. Omar Rabbi Zero, Omar Rav. Here the Gemara asks concerning the curses, or I should say the oaths, uh, that are mentioned in the Parsha of, so- of the Sota. There are two uh, psukim that mention the Kohen imposes upon her a vow. Uh, these are psukim uh, Yutes and Chof Aleph of Perik Hay. Uh, we uh, have included at the end of this volume of uh, the Gemara, for those who have uh, the entire volume of the Shas Ozer in their possession, all of the Psukim that are relevant to Parsha Sota. Uh, for those who don't, so take note of the Psukim uh, in Bamid Borhe, Posuk Yutes, it says, Vehishbiya Oiso Hakain, Viomer Lo Isha, Imlo Shochavisho Isoch, Vimlo Sotis. So, we read the Pasuk quickly, but you would have noted at the beginning of the Pasuk, it says, The Kohen imposes upon, uh, upon the Sota woman uh, an oath. And in Pasuk Chof Aleph, it says, our Gemara, Amar Rabbi Zeir Marav, Shtei Shvuas Hamurus Besot Olama. What do I need the Torah to uh, feature the Shvua twice in the case of the Sota? Now, in, in order to answer this question, you will notice we have answer number one, and a few lines later, Rava, after a question is raised, he gives a second approach. So the first approach is Achas Kidim Shinimchoka Megillah vi Achas li Achar Shinimchoka. One Shvua, one oath is apo- uh, imposed upon the woman uh, who's claiming her innocence before the Parsha is Nimchoka is erased, and the other one, the other Shvua is imposed upon her after it is erased. Maskif Law Rava. Rafa challenges this explanation. It says, Travayu Kodem Shinimchika Megillah Sivan. When you look in the Torah, the uh, erasure of the Parsha of the Sota is featured in Pasuk Chof Gimel. These two Shavuos, one in Pasuk Yud Tes and one in Pasuk Chof Aleph, are both before the erasure. So the uh, resolution just offered stating that one of the two Shavuos is stated because it is 
specifically after the erasure is simply not accurate. Elo Omar Rova, Achas Shvua Sheesh Imo Olo, the Achas Shvua Sheen Imo Olo. One is an oath that has together with it a an Ola, a curse, and one is a Shvua that doesn't have together with it the curse. The Gemara is not uh, going to analyze why is that necessary to have one with the curse, one without the curse, but rather the Gemara wants to know what do you mean by a Shvua Sheishi Ola? How is it actually articulated? Hechi Domi Shvua Sheishi Ola. What is meant by that in practical terms? So, as we look on in the Gemara, you notice a house shape that appears. There are three of them. On the side of the Gemara, under our Nosei Mivne heading, we feature the house marking Nisyonos Lehazbir Hechidomi Shvua Sheishi Ma'ola. These are attempts to explain what is meant by that. So now, we continue in the Gemara. Omer of Amram Omar Rav the Kohen says, Mashpiani Olaich Shelonit Mes. I impose upon you an oath that you uh, are innocent as you claim. In other words, the oath I impose upon you in, this, in effect is a verification of what you said. You said that I'm innocent. I did not conduct myself uh, in intimacy with that man. Sheim Nit Mes Yovo Beich. Uh, for if you were defiled, so Yovel Bech literally means the water will enter you, it means you will be you will be killed by the drinking the water. We take a look at the Rashi. Shelo Nitmes. The Rashi we're looking at is uh upper part of the narrow lines, around the uh sixth na- six narrow line approximately. He says Shelo Nitmes She At Omer Omeris Emes Shelo Nitmes. You, that that which you're saying that I am innocent, that I have not been defiled, is true. Hainu shvua sheish ima ola shim nitmeis yavo be chamayim lats boys beten v'hainu ola. We continue in the Gemara. Oma Rava. Rava doesn't accept Rav's presentation. He says, Ola lechud kaima ushvua lechuda kaima. Uh, in order to appreciate what Rava is saying, we go immediately to the Rashi. Oma Rava, Ola Lechudo Kaimo, Shvua Veola Yesh Kan. It is true that there is an oath and a curse in what we just read. Ushnehem Al Hoisha. Both are directed on the woman. Ukroksiv Bishvua Saola. The Pasuk. Itself says that the Kohen imposes upon her a Shvuas Ha'ola. That you saw in Posuk Chof Aleph. Sheha Shvua Shel Ola. That the oath is imposed on the curse. Now that sounds a little bit abstract, I believe, but nevertheless, as far as what Rav said, the entire statement, namely, I'll reading again what Rav had said, Mashbiyani, Olayach Shalonit Meis, Sheimnit Meis, for if you were defiled, so then uh, the water will uh, curse you, will kill you. The whole statement, as far as Rava is concerned, that whole statement is woman focused. It you don't, you don't have the Shvua relating to the curse. Let's continue then in the Gemara. Elo Omar Rava. Mashbi Aini Olaich Sheim Nitmeis Yavo Beich. So Rava's attempted, we'll say, upgrade or improvement is where he says, I, uh, I impose upon you by power of oath that if you were defiled, so Yavo Beich, the water will enter you and do its thing and kill you. As Rashi explains, he's mashpia, mashpia sa'olo shetachu. He's binding by oath the curse that it should take hold. Oma Ravashi. Now, before we go on, what we see in Rava's, at least his attempt, 
is that as opposed to Rav, where the Shvua did not relate to the Allah, to the curse, in Rava's presentation, the Shvua does relate to the curse. However, there's a, now an opposite problem. Omar Ravashi, Allah Ika Shvua Leka. That means, and again, this is quite abbreviated, but Rashi explains there the there is a curse here with the shvua being imposed on the curse, but there's no shvua imposed on the woman. The woman maintains that she's innocent. Well, she should be bound by an oath to uh, let's say to substantiate her claim. That you don't see in Rava's presentation. Ela Omar Rav Ashi, Mashbi'eni Alayich Shalodit Meis. This is the oath that's imposed on the woman, a, an oath whereby she verifies her claim of innocence. Ve'im nitmes. And here, this is the subtle difference between uh, Rav Ashi and Rav. Note, here it says, Ve'im nitmes. And if you were defiled, then yovo beich then the curse should take effect. My understanding of Ravashi is that when he says Mashpieni Olayach, in your mind's eye, there would, I didn't put this in by way of markings, but in your mind's eye there's a colon after Olayach. So I'm, the colon imposes upon her an oath. Point one, Shalonit Meis, a verification of her claim of innocence. And the Mashpieni Olayach, point two, the imnit mace, and if you happen to be defiled, so then the curse, the, the shvua, is imposed on the curse that it should take effect. So that the change for, with one letter difference, in the case of Rav's presentation, he said she'im, the shin of that word she'im nit mace, created a sense of one continuous statement, a continuous flow, whereby, as Rava objected, the shvua was imposed entirely on the woman. There was no, there was no say no change in in subject in that case. But with the vav in front of the word ve'im, it creates a split. Meaning, there's the topic of the shvua on the woman, ve'im nitmes, and now, as far as the curse is concerned, Yavo Beich, it will take hold through the power of this oath that is imposed upon the curse to take hold. These are uh, topics that, in, in my estimation, as we learn in a Dafyomi context, are a bit uh, abstract, but nevertheless, we tried our best to. Uh, to highlight the distinction between uh, Rav's approach and Ravashi's approach, which, when after all is said and done, it comes down to one letter uh, that makes all of the difference. Now, we continue with the Mishnah. The Mishnah is working with a reasonable su- uh, supposition or assumption that we're familiar with the Psukim. And we've mentioned time and time again to take advantage of of the list of psukim that we have at the end of our Mesichta, or those who have looked up the Chumash and have Bamidbor Perak Hay in front of them, so you would turn to Posuk Chof Beis. And in Posuk Chof Beis, you notice that after the oath is imposed on the woman, uh, the, it says at the end of that Posuk, the Omra Ha'isha Omein Omein. No words are extra in the Torah. No letters are extra in the Torah. And when you have a double expression like that, it, it cries out for an explanation. It says, and the woman responds, Amen, Amen. When a person, let's say, hears a bracha, he says Amen just once. Why is the Torah saying here, she says Amen twice? So this double Amen is a source of halacha for us. Now the Mishnah. Almahi oimeres omein omein. What is her doubling of the omein referring to? Omein al haolo, omein al hashvua. She is acknowledging the uh, curse, and she is acknowledging the oath that was imposed upon her, verifying her claim of innocence. Omein meish ze, omein meish acher. I am innocent from the man that I was warned about, 
and I am innocent with regard to any other man that uh, might that you might question uh, my uh, th- uh, concerning whose whose uh, relation with I you might have any questions. Now it's important to note that when when she says Amen uh, Meishacher, this other guy is not nece- it's not someone that she had received a warning from by her husband, uh, but once she is made to swear, there's a concept that we're going to see uh, in Rashi shortly called Gilgal Shvua. That it's literally rolling a Shvua from one onto another. In order for this concept of Shvua rollover, you have to have a basis of the first Shvua that's uh, rooted in the rules of the Shu. And in this case, the basis of the Sota is, is that the husband had warned her, Kinui, and she was subsequently found in seclusion, Stira. But once the process gets started, then if we, if the, let's say the, uh, the husband wants to raise uh, suspicions about her fidelity with regard to uh, any other men, he can do so. Omein Shelo Sotisi, she says, I proclaim my innocence. Shelo Sotisi, I didn't go uh, to go astray. Arusa Unesua. Two more examples. Vishomeris Yovam Uknusa. Let's explain. First, we go to Rashi. Arusa Unesua. Ayade Gilgal Shvua, who Megagal Eznus Shel Erisin. is the initial stage of marriage before a couple consummates the marriage. Here you have a husband that had consummated his marriage with his wife, fully married couple. He warned her not to be with so-and-so, and she went ahead and violated his warning, went into seclusion with so-and-so, and the Sota comes to the Beis Hamikdash, and she is made to swear that she wasn't with so-and-so, the man that was specified, and also that she wasn't with anybody even before they consummated the marriage, after he had uh, offered uh, money to her or something of value to start the marriage process, the Erusin. So that even though regarding that period of time there had been no Kinui or Stira, he wouldn't have been able to do so. But once as a Nisua, once as a fully married couple, he uh, started the Sota process as we already ex- explained, she can be made to swear concerning uh, events during her Arusa or Erusin status. And this is the basis for Gilgal Shvua from the Torah. The fact that the word Omein is repeated twice and we see that she is made to swear about uh, a, a second uh, topic, a second event that she wouldn't have been able to be, uh, be made to swear about uh, initially but now since she's swearing about the uh, uh, suspicion after Nisuin, she can be made to swear about the Erusin period of time as well. That's Gilgal Shvua, and its its uh, its foundation is right here in the Torah. It's not a Din de Rabona, It's not a rabbinic law. On the top of Amit Beis, we saw a second uh, example: Shomeris Yava Muknusa. So Rashi explains on the top: Shomeris Yava Muknusa vim hoisi yavimto vikansa. If it's a case of a Yibo marriage, a man married a woman after his brother died, leaving his, uh, this woman as a, an almona and he is not having left any children, the brothers, the surviving brother's marriage to her is called a Yibo marriage. He takes her in, they become a full-fledged couple, and he then uh, becomes suspicious that she's been with, she's with another guy, and he warns her, and then she goes into seclusion. The Sota process gets started, and he then says, I want you to swear also that you weren't defiled while you were a Shemeris Yavam. What's a Shemeris Yavam? That's this woman's status between the death of her first husband before she actually consummates her marriage with the Yavam, with her second husband, the, her, her brother-in-law. So during that interim period, she's called a Shemeris Yavam. The oath that's imposed is only after she Kenusa, she was taken in by the by her brother-in-law, consummated their marriage, and then was Mekana and there was Stira. 
he can make her swear concerning the Shemeris Yovam period of time as well, that she uh, did not have relations with uh, some other guy. Omein shelo nitmesi, ve'im nitmesi yovobi. Rashi. This point is very much a, we'll say, a parallel to the discussion we had just before this Mishnah concerning the Shvua Shieshi Mo'ola. So now, uh, take a look at Rashi on the fourth line from the top. Omein Shalonit Mesi, Hainu Kabola Shvua. Here she's accepting. The Omein is a word of affirmation. She's affirming the Shvua, she's accepting the Shvua that of, of, of Lonit Mesi, of I am innocent. The Imnit Mesi of Obi, that is also what she says. What is that? Hainu Kabolas Allah. That's her accepting of the curse. Uh, that if she's lying, she'll die as a result of drinking the water. This reaction on the woman's part is, in fact, a reflection, a continuation of the way the oath was imposed on her. As we saw before this mission in the Gemara, Mashbi'eni Olayach Shalom, it makes the Kohen imposes the oath upon her that to uh, verify her claim that she is innocent. The Im, and notice how Rashi is very, very careful. The Im, that's what Ravashi's version was. The Im, it makes you Volbech, Vahainu, Pirusho. The Omein al Hashvua, Omein al Haola, the Sanyo Beresha. At the uh, beginning of the Mishnah, we saw it say Omein al Haola, Omein al Hashvua, and here the Mishnah is essentially explaining that the Omein Shalom it is the Omein on the Shvua, and the Im it Yavobi, that's the Omein on the Ola, the curse. Rabbi Meir Omer Omein Shalom it the uh, the uh, double omains in the Mishnah uh, uh, teaches us that she swears that she was not de- uh, defiled, that she did not have intimacy. Omain shalo et ma, and this is quite interesting. This is a future tense shvua. She is uh, uh, swearing by saying omain. She's accepting the oath upon herself with regard to the future. Now, what does that mean? So we look at the Rashi. If, let us say, this woman, afterwards, the next day, next month, next year, uh, happens to have illicit relations. The waters that she drank a year ago will be revived, so to speak. They will be aroused and they will cause her death. We continue. Hakol Shovin, She'ein Masne Imo Lo Al Kidem Shitis Ares. Everyone agrees. Even Rabbi Meir, who seems to be rather, we'll say, uh, broad and, and strict in his approach, meaning he's uh, holding her responsible even for future events. Everyone agrees, though, that the. Shavuos that we're talking about and the, the curse uh, that is being imposed upon her does not cover times that were before she was an Arusa you'll notice that we're following the a, a changed girsa we're reading based on the Bach the Bach has two alternative girsos and we're following his second girsa that we've included between the lines where Everyone agrees that if, if, even though she might have behaved uh, having uh, s- uh, sexual intimacy with men, but at a point in time before she was an Arusa, a single woman fooling around, or Mishen is Garsha, or uh, after she was divorced from her husband. Again, in that sense, she's a single woman at that point. She had uh, gone into seclusion with some man and, and experienced uh, intimacy. And afterwards, her original husband took her back. The masna uh, literally means the, the conditions, the stipulations, the, for our purposes, the, impo- the imposing of an oath upon her wouldn't have any relevance to these time periods, namely before Erisin 
or after she was divorced. Ze haklal, and the following is the rule. Kol sheti boel v'lohoi sasura lo lohoi amas neima. Any type of intimacy that would not result in her being prohibited to her husband, that type of intimacy would not be the subject of the vows and curses that we are talking about here. Before we begin the Gemara, we glance at the side, we have a topic heading, the no say, Shemeris Yavam Shezinsa. If it sounds familiar, well, if you look at the very top phrase of this page, we saw the term Shemeris Yavam. This is the case of the woman who was married to Ruvain. We'll use the names Ruvain and Shimon, two brothers. Ruvain died, leaving no children. Woman then is expected to do Yibum and marry Shimon. During the interim period, she is called not just a widow, because she's a special widow. She's a Shomeris Yavam. Is she free to marry anyone she pleases at that point? No, absolutely not. She's not allowed to. Can she be released from this bond? She certainly can. It's called, she's done through the process called Chalitza, the shoe removal ceremony. But until that's done, she is restricted. She's a Shomeris Yavam. What is the law if she conducts intimacy with some other man, some outsider, uh, other than, of course, the brother-in-law, an, an act of intimacy is called znus. Uh, a, a, a prohibited act of intimacy is called znus. Does her behavior in that fashion, while a shemer is job during that interim period, does that render her prohibited to the yavam? Let us make something perfectly clear. A married woman that has an affair with a man, with some other man, becomes prohibited to her husband. What is the din of a Shomeris Yavam that has an affair? We now start the Gemara, and we start with a point. It's a long point. The question that we just presented, if you were sensitive to the reading of the Mishnah, you probably could come up with the answer on your own. Let's see the Gemara. Omar Rav Hamnuna. Shemeris Yavam Shezinsa. If she was Mizane, she had uh, re- intimacy with some outsider. While a Shemeris Yavam during that interim period, Asura Liyavama. She is Usur. She cannot go ahead and do Yibam. She's Usur to Shimon, to the uh, surviving brother. Mimai. How does Rav Hamnuna know that? Midikotani from the fact that the Mishnah said at the top line Shomeris Yavam Uknusa and we explained that a woman who is a Knusa that means the we had her married originally to Ruvain and then he died leaving no children she was then a Knusa to Shimon Shimon took her in you know married a Yibo marriage after Shimon takes her in he then warns her and she goes into seclusion with that paramour she is brought to the base of Mikdash. She is made to swear con- uh, concerning her innocence, if she's maintaining innocence, regarding that specific uh, warning, the man concerning whom she was warned, and also that she was faithful during the Shomeris Yavam period as well. So she's made to swear concerning the Shomeris Yavam period as well. What does that show you about the Shomeris Yavam period? If you would say that a Shomeris Yavam who actually deviated during that period would become usher prohibited to the Yavam, because of that, the oath can be imposed on her regarding that time period, the Shomeris Yavam period as well. If you would say that her uh, like a loose behavior during that time period would not have rendered her prohibited to the Yavam, to the surviving brother. Hechi Masne Bahado, 
How can an oath be imposed upon her concerning that time period if, if it wouldn't have affected her relationship with the Yavam? The Hatnan. We learned in our mission as Zehaklal. The following is the rule. Kol she'ilu tiboel velote asur lo. Lo hoya mas Any type of intimacy that would not have resulted in her in her being prohibited to the husband, in this case to the Yavam, he wouldn't have imposed an oath regarding that. So the fact that an oath can be imposed regarding the Shemeris Yavam time period indicates that if she did have relations at that point in time, she would become prohibited to the Yavam. We should point out that a Shomeris Yofam, as we mentioned earlier, is not allowed to have relations with other people. She is uh, bound, there's a, there's a bond between her and the Yofam. In terms of halachic severity, what would be the din if she did have illicit relations during that time period? Is that considered on the same level as, as standard Arias? Standard Arias... Uh, includes uh, brothers and sisters, uh, fathers and daughters, uh, and uh, all those uh, forbidden women that are listed off in, in Parshas Achrimos, and you see them in Parshas Kedoshim. Those are the list of Arias, the, the uh, high-level prohibited forbidden relatives. Is a Shomeris Yavam who has relations with an outsider of that same level of prohibition? No, absolutely not. It's considered a violation of a negative command. Lo siyeishis hameita chuseli zor. The Pesach says that she should not be with a stranger. It's a negative, it's the, considered a lav, a, uh, a lower level offense. Nevertheless, the Gemara is concluding that from the Mishnah, that a Shemeris Yavam Shezinsa would become prohibited to the Yavam. Otherwise, the Yavam would not have imposed the uh, the Shavua on her regarding that time period. It, it would have been outside of his realm. The Gemara responds, Amri b'ma'arova less hilchasot Rav Hamluna. In ma'arova, in Eretz Yisrael, we don't rule like Rav Hamluna. If that be the case, then a Shemeris Yavam Shizinsa would not become usher to the Yavam. Oh, she wouldn't become usher to the Yavam. Well, then how do you make sense of the Mishnah? The Elaha, the Katani Shemeris Yavam Uknusa. That which the Mishnah teaches that the Yavam can impose a uh, Shvua on her regarding the Shemeris Yavam period as well. And we know that a, a Shvua cannot be imposed unless that relationship would have, if she uh, had an affair with an outsider, would have resulted in their being prohibited. It, she wouldn't be, uh, if, if not that, if, he wouldn't be able to impose an oath on her. So the Gemara says, Ha money, the Mishnah is actually Rebbe Akiva he. The Mishnah is in accordance with Rebbe Akiva, who does, uh, represents an opinion, but not one that the Gemara accepts as a final halacha. The Yoma, Rebbe Akiva, who says, Ein Kedushin Toysin Bechayve Lavin, Umashvi Lo Ki Erva. Rabbi Kiva has a very high and strict standard with regard to this, this realm of prohibited relations. If a woman is prohibited on a lav, lav is a negative command, not to be confused with the word love in English, obviously. Here we're talking about lav, a negative command. We say, If a woman is prohibited to a man, to the tune of, or at the level of a negative command, and if he attempts to marry her, the Kedushin, the marriage, does not take hold. Ein Kedushin Tosin means the Kedushin, the, the offer of marriage to her, does not take hold. A Yavam a Yavama, that is, the Shemeris Yavam, the woman, while she's in that interim period, her uh, status with regard to uh, outsiders is, as we said before, a negative command. It's a laugh. In Rabbi Akiva's mindset, there is no difference between a lav and a chorus of erva 
forbidden relations that are prohibited to, uh, if violated, result in a kores punishment, a lav is a type of prohibition that will result in lashing. Uh, the standard erva is an illicit relation that would result in a kores punishment. But as far as Rebbe, uh, and uh, when it comes to kores level offenses in the realm of uh, forbidden relations, uh, a marriage wouldn't take hold. Uh, for according to m- uh, most opinions, of course, if a brother gives money to his sister in marriage, the sister is not considered married to the brother, and she can marry anyone she likes. Nothing to hold. According to Rabbi Kiva, relations that are prohibited as a mere love, as well, do not take hold. Now, all of that, what does it mean for us? So, as far as Rabbi Kiva's mindset is concerned, the Yavama is like an erva. And since the Yavama is like an erva, if she has relations at that during that time period with some outsider, it will result in her becoming usher to the Yavam. The Rabbanon, though, disagree with that. Let's take a look at Rashi. Ein Kedushin Tosin Le'isho HaAsura Al-Mekatshe Balav means Kedushin does not take hold with a man and woman when the woman is prohibited to the man to the tune of a lav, a negative command. The Rabbonin Pligi Olei V'amri B'chai Ve'krisis Hu Delo Tafsi Avu B'chai Ve'lav in Tafsi The Rabbonin disagree and say that when it comes to a prohibited relationship that would be punishable by Kores so then a marriage does not take hold. But when it comes to a prohibited marriage, but it's only prohibited to the tune of a negative command, even though it's a wrong thing to do, she nevertheless is considered married to him. According to Rebbe Kiva, he makes the, those kind of uh, severe chayve lavin, uh, the Rashi here is, a, is I, I say it's, it, he, it's loaded because he adds the word chamuros. We're not going to get involved with the, all the other sugis and shas you find in Masechus Kiddushin. I think in Masechus Kiddushin as well. Uh, quite a discussion concerning Rabbi Kiva with Rabbi Yesheva and Rabbi Simoy. How broad does Rabbi Kiva extend his classification in the realm of Lavin to parallel to Chiyuve Kores? Be that as it may, uh, Rabbi Akiva is telling us that. Chayve Lavin are s- severe enough that we view them like Chayve Kores, Shavlad Mamzer. The child that results would be considered a Mamzer, often translated as an illegitimate child. Ulegabi Les or Albaylo Nami, and here's the, the main point for us, and regarding prohibiting her on her husband as well, Kihechi, Tehabo Aleishis Ish, just like one who has intimacy with a married woman, she bekores. That's a, a high-level prohibition, punishable by kores. And one who has relations with a married woman, asura abaylo, she becomes also to her husband. Kain ha boal shemeres yavam nami, she Allah below siyeish sameis achutzli zor. An outsider that has relations with the shemeres yavam is in violation of a negative command that we just cited. Osra al yavama will make her prohibited to the Yavam. So notice the parallel. Just like an outsider that has intimacy with a full married woman makes that full married woman prohibited to her husband, an outsider that has relations with the Shemeris Yavam makes her prohibited to the Yavam. And that's uh, as far as the uh, ruling of the Gemara is concerned. We're not going to follow Rav Hamluna. And as far as the Mishnah is concerned, it is taught in accordance with Rabbi Akiva, who has his unique standard. We turn back to the Gemara. Boy, Rabbi Yirmiya. Ma'u, and before we go on, maybe let's take a look at the side. We have a Nosei topic heading. Birur Efshorios Nosafos Amayochala Baalahasnos. We're going to investigate uh, examples beyond those that were listed in the Mishnah concerning what a husband can. Uh, impose upon the sota, his wife, who's a sota, uh, topics of, uh, uh, let's say, forbidden relations beyond the actual man 
concerning whom he had expressed his kinui. Boy, Rabbi Yirmiyah, Mal shiyasne adam al nisuin harishonim. Another question, al nisue achiv mahu. What does nisuin harishonim mean? A man was married to a woman and he divorced the woman. And after he divorced her, he then took her back. When we say he, he took her back, that's making, of course, the assumption that she didn't marry someone else in the interim. So a man divorced his wife, took her back, and after he took her back, then the, the Sota process set in. He was a mekana, he made a he warned her, and she was in seclusion with someone. Can he now impose upon her an oath to verify her fidelity during their first marriage. That's Nisu Marishonim. What's Nisu Eochiv? That's a case of a Yavam who married his sister-in-law. And after they got married, she became a Sota. Can the Yavam say, I want you to swear that while you were married to my brother, you had been pure. You had been faithful. So, what is the din? Toshma ze haklal. From the principal talk in the Mishnah, we can answer this question. The Mishnah said, the following is the rule. Kol boyo velote asurolo. Any type of intimacy <clears throat> that would not have resulted in her becoming usur prohibited to her husband, lo hoya The husband would not impose an oath on her concerning th- those kinds of relations. But we can infer from this very simply, ha asira. However, relations, intimacies that she may have had that would make her prohibited to her husband, ha chinami damasne. Those kind of relations he can impose upon her the oath. So in these two questions... Let's think about it. A man divorced his wife, took her back, and then it turns out, let us say, it turns out that she she actually had intimacy with some other man during their first stage of marriage. The halacha is that a married woman who has relations with an outsider, she becomes prohibited to the outsider, and she becomes prohibited to her husband as well. Permanently prohibited. So therefore, as far as Nisuim Harishonim is concerned, the, this husband who is imposing the vows of Sota during their second stage of marriage, by all means, he can make her swear concerning their first stage, their first, their first round, because had she engaged in prohibited uh, uh, intimacy, that would have rendered her prohibited to her husband right now. And the same is true with regard to the Yavam. Had she behaved, behaved illicitly during her marriage to the deceased brother, she would not be allowed to have married the Yavam. She would have become prohibited to her husband. And if she becomes prohibited to her husband, when he dies, she's out of the picture. She's not going to do Yibul. Shmamina. So this is conclusive. Rabbi Meir Oimer Omein Shalo Nit Meisi Omein Shalo Etma. Rabbi Meir spoke about the imposing of a shvua with a future tense as well. Tanya Lo Kishoma Rabbi Meir Omein Shalo Etma. Sheim Titame Mayim Boikim Oiso Me'achshav. When Rabbi Meir said that a shvua can be imposed upon her concerning the future, it's not as if to say that, well, in the event that she would have uh, uh, um, relations in the future, the, the, the water will check her out right now, will cause her to get very sick right now. Ella, rather, the, what Rabbi Meir said when he says that she swears concerning the future as well, it's lichashitame when if she does in the future become defiled, Mayim Ma'arin Osalbotkinasa, the water that she's drinking now will become aroused, will become revived, and 
she will be checked out by the water then, she'll be killed by the water then. Boy Ravashi, Mahu Shiyasne Odom Al Nisuim Hoachrinim. According to Rebbe Meir, who speaks about imposing a shvua concerning the future, what is going to be regarding a man uh, saying, a man whose uh, wife has become a sota, I want you to swear that you will not be uh, unfaithful if I divorce you and then take you back. And in that future second stage, if you are uh, unfaithful, so then let this water check you out. Let it have its effect. Now, two sides of the analysis. Hashto miha lo asira le. Right now, she is not prohibited to him. Odilma zimnin de megarish law, the hodar mahadar law. On the other hand, he might in fact divorce her and then take her back. And at that point, when he does take her back, if she has illicit relations, she will be ushered to him. And therefore, it falls in the realm of things that the husband can impose upon her the oath. Toshma, Hakol, Shovin, everyone will agree, of course, this is a quote from the Mishnah, She lo hoyamas nimo lo al kudem shetisares, lo al achar shetisgarish, vetistar li echod vetitame, vi achar kach yachzirena. Um, everyone is in agreement that the imposition of an oath concerning either the time before they ever entered marriage or the time after he divorces his wife and then she has uh, she has an affair with some man after she is divorced and then afterwards the husband takes her back the oath is not imposed concerning any of either of these cases but now let us infer. Take note of our dashed underlining. What is something he does not make her swear about? Where you have the titame, that means the intimacy, followed by his the husband's vachakach yachzirana, the husband's remarriage to her. In that scenario, she was having the affair, or she was having intimacy, maybe affair is not an accurate word, she was having the intimacy when she was at a single woman, she had been divorced prior to her being remarried. But we infer, however, the scenario that Ravashi was asking about, uh, namely her being taken back in a remarriage to her first husband, and then being involved with an affair, that is something that the husband can impose upon her. In, in oath form. Shmamino, so this is conclusive. Before we go further in the Gemara, we have a topic heading, the no say. Hayim Isha Shoisa Vishayna. Can a woman be made to drink as a sota and then a second time? We will see as we go through the Gemara, Shalosh Deus, there are three Deus on this topic. Hagemora masbira shecholkim beech lidroi shaposek zois teiras haknois. The machlokis that will follow will be technically actually you'll see a three-way machlokis as we pointed out. Gimel deus, how to deal with this posek zois teiras haknois? Zos limute mai. The word zos is a limitation expression. What does it limit? And Torah is an inclusive expression. My, what cases does it come to include? Now the Gemara. Tonu Rabbanon. Zois Torah Saknos. Malame. This teaches us. Shoisha Shoisha Vishoina. That's the first opinion. That a Soto can be made to drink and do it again. Rabbi Yudah Omer. Zos. She'eno Isha Shoisha Vishoina. According to Rabbi the word Zos is a limitation expression. How much it is limited? That we have to wait and see. Omer Vihuda, Maise Vehei Id Lefanenu Nechunya Chayf Rishichin. There was an incident, and Nechunya, the well digger, uh, testified, Shoisha, Shoisha Vishayna, that 
a woman does uh, repeat the drinking. She can be made to drink on two separate occasions. The Kibano do so, and we accepted his report, his testimony, in the following. Bishnei Anoshim. Shnei Anoshim means two men. Avoloi Be'ish Echad. But not with regard to the same man. We haven't explained very much. We simply translated. First point I want to make, make mention of is that this is within Rabbi Huda. Where does that leave us regarding the Tanakama? The Tanakama said in an unqualified fashion, no distinction between one man and two men. We take a look in the Rashi. He says, "Bishnei Anoshim imes bailo." Rashi, you can see, is toward the end of the page. He says the second line from the Vada "Bishnei Anoshim imes bailo zeh shehishka v'nises liacher v'kine lo v'hinistero." If uh, the husband that originally had brought her to the base of Mitzvah is Sota, he dies, and she then marries a second man, a second husband, v'kine lo v'hinistero. And that second husband had suspicions about his wife's behavior and he warned her and she went into seclusion. And Rabbi Yudah tells us that we accepted Nechunya's testimony that a woman can be made to drink twice in the case of two husbands. The Rashi, you'll notice, continues at the top of Yud Tesom and Aleph. The Rabbi Yudah Dorish Zos, Rabbi Yudah explained that the limitation word zos, limute she nishesu v'shen yedei ba'al echad im chozar v'kino lo that uh, one husband cannot uh, make her into a sota twice that's what zos accomplishes, limits a husband with regard to this particular wife only one time Vidorish Toiras, Rebuta will explain the word Tersla the rabbis to include Shishay Sapam Shnia, Aide Baal Shani. That if she finds herself married to a second husband, that second husband can subject her to a Sota experience. Uh, even though for this woman it's a second time. That's Shaysa Vishina. Um Rabihuda the Ayade Baal Shani, Khizeris Vishaisa from the fact that Rabbi Yudah says that the idea of a woman drinking a second time, that's only because it's with regard to a second husband, Michlal de Kamo, we can therefore infer that as far as the first opinion in the Mishnah, Filu Baal Echod, Mashke Shnei Pa'omim, that one husband can make her drink twice. V'hainu de Parchinon, and with this in mind, we will see the Gemara asking, V'tana Kamo Ha'oksiv Zos, what does the Tanakama do with the Zos expression, which is a limitation? If the way we're presenting things now, we don't see any limitation on the part of the Tanakama. Let's go back to the Gemara where we left off. I hope everyone sees we are five lines from the bottom of Yud Chesom at Beis. This third opinion says a woman is not to drink, she's not made to drink twice, whether it's the original husband or even a second husband. The Gemara asks, the Tanakama Nami Hoksiv Zos. According to the Tanakama, it seems that the woman will always be made to drink twice. Even the first, even one husband can make her drink twice. Where is there any manifestation of? Zos a limitation. For Abonan Basroi, Nami Hog Siv Toiras. The final opinion that we saw said the woman is never made to drink twice. So where is there a manifestation of Toras, which we said is an inclusive expression? Omar Rova. Beish Echod Uboyo Echod. If it's one husband and a particular individual who is suspect, some man who, with whom she is suspected of having an affair everyone will agree even the Tanakama will agree 
that a husband can warn his wife regarding a specific man only once. The Gemara continues at the top of Yutes Amanaf Tichtiv Zos. Zos is a limitation expression. If a husband is suspected that his wife is having an affair with some guy, we'll call him uh, Mr. X, the husband cannot warn his wife regarding Mr. X more than one time. That's something everyone agrees with. A second case, a second scenario. Two husbands. Husband number one warns her about Mr. X. Now that same woman, after husband one dies, she marries Mr. Two. Husband number two. And husband number two warns her, I don't want you to be with Mr. Y. A different boyo. Boyo is the paramour. Some second guy. Now as far as the woman herself is concerned, she's going through the Sota process now two times. Well, the Kule Alma, Lo Pligi, everyone agrees. Even the Rabbonan Basroi, who seems so restrictive, they agree to Isha Shaysa The woman can be made to drink twice, Dichtiv Toras. In other words, she can be subjected to the Sota experience twice, because you're dealing with the two times as a result of two separate husbands regarding two separate paramours. Key Pligi, where a Tanaic controversy arises are in scenarios that we call three and four. One husband who suspects his wife on two separate occasions of being with two paramours, Mr. X and Mr. Y, or two husbands, husband number one, and after he died, she married husband number two. But both of these husbands are suspicious of her being with the same paramour, the same Mr. X. So cases three and four we will find are controversial by way of the Tanaic opinions. And here the Gemara goes through each one of the opinions. The double underline marking here highlights, and on the, uh, you can see we have a Mivne heading, it highlights Hadgosha Shita Satanoim Shechok Beinyan Shaysavishaita. The highlighting of the different Tanaic opinions uh, regarding the woman being made to drink twice. Now the Gemara continues. Tanakama Sovar Toras, the Toras inclusionary expression is Lirbuye Kuli. In, all, in almost all the scenarios, this woman can be subjected to the Sota process on uh, twice. Zos, the case, the, the word Zos in the Torah is Lim'uti, it's to the exclusion of only case number one. Ish Echod Boyal Echod. That the, the same, that the same husband cannot warn her twice about the same paramour. For Abonan Basroi Savri, the last opinion holds that Zos Lemuti Kuli, the Zos limits the woman to only one Sota experience to the in, in, all, in almost all of the cases above. Toras, however, the word Toras will manifest itself Lerbuye Shne Anoshim Ushne Boyalim. Case number two, two separate husbands. And two separate paramours. In that case, the Rabbon and Basroi, the la- Basroi means the latter, the last ones, the, the third opinion, they will say, in that case, it's two separate husbands and two separate paramours, she can be made to drink twice. Rebbe Yehuda, Zos Limuti Tarti, Toras Libuye Tarti. The word Zos has the effect of excluding two scenarios of the woman becoming a Sota twice. And Torah includes two cases where she can become a Sota twice. Zos lim uti tarti. There are two situations where she cannot be made to drink twice. Case number one, ish echod boyal echod. The same husband with regard to the same paramour, she cannot be warned twice. And ish echod ushnei boyalim. 
one husband with two separate paramours. That's to be excluded. She won't be drinking twice. We're going to see some depth to this uh, in, a, in a little in a moment after we finish the Gemara. We'll see in in the Rashi some insight here. Torahs Tati, We're continuing in the Gemara. The word Torahs includes two scenarios where she can be made to drink twice. Case number four: Shnei Anoshim Uboyal Echad. Two separate husbands who are both suspicious of the same paramour. Shnei Anoshim Ushnei Boilem. With the most obvious case where she can be made to drink twice is two separate husbands and two separate paramours. Now we take a look at Rashi to appreciate Rabbi Huda a little more. Rabbi Huda, the Rashi says, Svira Lei, the Chule, the Achar Shiriba Kosovo Mie. Once you have a Posik part of it including part of an excluding Velopirish Maribo Ma Mie, the Posik doesn't specify what's being included, what's being excluded. Al Korchach Lomosra Kosovella Chachomim, Lefarish Loch, Lefi Chachmasam, Ma Ribo Ma Mie. Therefore, the Almighty gives the sages the power through their wisdom to explain what is included and what is excluded. It's most likely that this idea of the woman being subjected to a, a, a second Sota experience would apply only in, this, in the cases of two separate husbands. Even if it's concerning the same paramour, However, v'loi ashnei boil v'bal echod. However, to suggest that she can be made to be a sota twice by the same husband, even if it's two separate paramours, that no. Kevon de kina lo kvar v'nimseis nikia. Since he, the same husband, one husband, he warned her once. And she turned out clean. She turned out the water had no effect on her. She turned out to be a tzadikis. She was a uh, a righteous woman. Now, you have a husband, sees his woman, his wife is righteous, she went through this uh, terrible ordeal, this soto ordeal, comes out clean. This man, this same husband, is what, he's going to warn her again? Nira HaDavar, it appears to us, She'odam Kantaron who? That he's a tough guy. Kantaron, somewhat rem- reminiscent of the word cantankerous. And he wants to infuriate her. He wants to frustrate her, cause contention, kantaron, contention. Hilkoch lo shno mechashad rishon velo shno meachir. Therefore, when it comes to the same husband, doesn't, we're not going to make a distinction whether he's repeating his suspicion of the same guy, the same Mr. X, or even if it's not just Mr. X, but the, the husband is worried on a second occasion that she's with Mr. Y. Once this man saw her come out clean, he should leave her alone, so to speak. Therefore, there's no shoyna v'shoysa as far as rebuke is concerned when you're dealing uh, the, with the one husband. For Hashem, you can see we've uh, reached the end of the first parak of Masecha Sota, Mitzvah Hashem. Now our next year we'll start the second parak. With that, we conclude our Shior for today.